Yeah, I've heard right. Twitter comment. The greatest people and Charles Ashby. Thank you very much for that. You're welcome. <laughs> we'll uh, we'll go ahead and get started now. Um, uh, thanks everybody for joining. Uh, my name is Dan Petty. I'm president of the Denver Press Club. Um, we've got a lot of attendees on. Um, so folks who are uh, attending, um, please, uh, if you have questions throughout, um, you can drop those in the chat. Um, there's uh, also a Q&A feature uh, as well. Uh, I'll be honest, this is the first time we're using the webinar portion of Zoom. We've previously done meetings, but we had so many people register for this that I just wanted to try to keep it under control because uh, you never know like an errant uh, dog barking in the background or, or something else. So. Um, we're really pleased to welcome a bunch of folks with us. So I'm going to give you a quick spiel on Denver Press Club. Um, we are a 501c3 nonprofit um, based down at 1330 Glenarm Place. Um, we have a bar, uh, like a lot of bars, most bars, all bars. We are closed right now. Um, so we are hold, hosting and holding events uh, like so many other people through Zoom uh, and other, um, other great tools like this. Um, we are member supported. Um, uh, every many people on this uh, on this call are members, um, and uh, you know, for media members, it's a hundred and fifty dollars a year. For non-media members, it's two seventy-five. And then we've got other memberships for uh, people who are non-residents, other things like that. Membership really supports us, particularly now in this time. Um, we know a lot of people, of course, are um, you know struggling. But if you can support us, a membership is a great way to do that. Uh, we give uh, scholarships to journalism students in Colorado uh, at Colorado schools every year. This year, we gave out fifteen thousand dollars in scholarships, and actually, that money was just deployed a couple of weeks ago, which was uh, great uh, for for all the kids from nine different Colorado colleges and universities. Uh, we also um, do programming like this, usually in person uh, when we can, and we hope to do that soon. Um, and then we also support our historic building at thirteen thirty Glenarm Place in Denver, uh, which is on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, this is being broadcast and recorded live. Um, and uh, again, thanks so much everybody for coming. I will now turn it over to our moderator, Linda Shapley of Colorado Politics. Linda, go ahead. Hi everybody. I'm so glad that you could join us. Um, I'm uh, really excited by the conversation and the fact that so many people have decided to attend just because I think it's a really interesting topic. So I'm really looking forward to hearing your questions and you know, let's have a great conversation. So I'm going to start off by talking or, you know, letting my panelists introduce themselves. So first we'll go from A to Z. So uh, Charles Ashby is uh, cover state and politics for the Grand Junction Daily Sentinel. So Charles, why don't you introduce yourself and then uh, why don't you give us your favorite feature of the Capitol that you missed? Charles, you might need to turn your video off. Yes. Hey, Charles, turn your video off, and that'll probably help the sound come through. Yeah, I, I'll go ahead and take care of that. Hello. Yeah, that worked. Ben, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Go ahead. All right, sorry, I turned my video off, so that's probably better. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I missed nothing uh, not at the Capitol right now. I've been done it for 24 years. One more year or two more years than Marianne. I can't remember. She can remind us. Um, I forgot what the other part of the question was, but no, I've been covering the Capitol for a long, long, long time. And I can tell you that every single year, everybody says this is the weirdest session we've ever had and that is true every year but this year is like huh it's been a session that hasn't been a session it's just it is by far and i don't think i can see it ever getting any weirder than this so yeah it's been oddly well odd um so you know i've been busy here in grand junction having to stay here because not only are you know we dealing with this, this COVID stuff, but we're understaffed here. We lost a few people, which is not unusual for newspapers um, and TV and radio for that matter. So I've had to you know stay home and do more work here than I've normally done, but trying to keep tabs of what's going on over there. Um, so yeah, it's uh, you know I've seen some some 
good stuff and some really ugly stuff. Uh, and this is just weird stuff. All right. Um, so then why don't we go next to Marianne Goodland. Uh, bio and then tell us what you miss about the Capitol building. All right, that's, that's an easy. Um, I have been covering the General Assembly since 1998. Um, there was one year that I took to go off and try and do something else that I didn't like, so then I went back. Um, I, have, I started off, I did my first 11 years in covering higher ed uh, for a little newspaper called the Silver and Gold Record, which went by the wayside in the 2009 recession, sort of. Um, the thing I miss, and then and I've also worked for the Colorado Statesman, uh, the Colorado Independent, and now I'm with Colorado Politics once again and having a wonderful time. Um, I kind of consider this my dream job. Uh, the thing I miss most about the Capitol is that wonderful new water fountain. I love that water fountain. That thing, that thing is awesome. I miss the water fountain. And I also, but I also miss the people because um, the, the Capitol is endlessly fascinating. And I would agree 100% with Charles. This has been the weirdest session in a, and we, and the two of us have seen a lot of weird sessions over the years, but this one, this one has, has put weird at a whole new level. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Marianne. And then uh, last is uh, Marshall Zellinger from Nine News. Hello. Well, I've been covering the Capitol informally since 2004 when I started working in Colorado Springs, where I was at for six years before going to Channel 7 for seven years, and now at Channel 9 for the last three. Um, unlike Charles and Marianne, I am an infrequent, um, make, I make infrequent appearance at the Capitol, but I still cover politics mainly on a daily basis. We just don't always go into the building. Um, I. I defer to them on the weirdness of this session. Um, I, I, I know from the standpoint of what we're going through, I'll never see anything like this again. And this, well, maybe next year, because I don't think we'll be through uh, the changes that will have to be made at the Capitol for access and for what actually happens. Uh, I see that for quite some time. Uh, what I miss most, uh, my joke answer is Charles ribbing me about my Smedium outfits, uh, but I don't know that I miss that all that much. Uh, the answer, so this will go to a, a topic I want to talk about later. Like my honest answer, I miss parking on the sidewalk at the Capitol, which has nothing to do with COVID-19. It just went away this year because it went away, but I probably miss that the most. Okay, that's great. That's great. So I'm uh, glad, you know, you guys have already brought up uh, a big part of what's going on here, which is the fact that we are um, about to start in, you know, uh, five days. We're going to start day 68 of the session, um, which uh, Actually, usually I think it's day 69. Oh, well, according, well, day 67 is what I saw. But anyway, so Perfect. day 67, day 68, day 69. Um, so essentially, you know, by pausing the session, which was something that uh, had never been done to this extent before, I think there had been a snowstorm or something like that. There was, there's been just this amazing change since, since that March date. And, um, you know, we left in March with a uh, surplus. We left with a lot of items on a wish list. And we've come back to a number of some of the those items are now the wish list is gone and there's a $3.3 billion budget cut. Um, so I would say that, you know, you guys in a lot of ways um, have more experience than some of the lawmakers in, in seeing what happens in a, you know, what's happened in, pre in previous recessions. And so Marianne, why don't you uh, tell me a little bit about just like how you think this crisis compares to, say, the, you know, recession after 9-11 attacks or, you know, the Great Recession in 2008-2009? Wow, that's, that's a biggie. Um, if you start with the 9-11 recession, and that one went on from uh, probably late 2001 through about 2003, and Charles, correct me, if I'm not getting this right. Uh, that was the first time that you really saw the Joint Budget Committee really struggling to find the, the, the coins in the couch cushions. 
they rated everything they could possibly think of. Um, they, made, they made changes that we still see today. Um, one was the cut to higher ed. I don't think higher ed ever really fully recovered from that because that was, that was when you saw huge tuition increases. You saw students being asked to pay for academic buildings. That happened with the, uh, the law school up at CU Boulder. That was what I remembered. Um, most most specifically. And then you also saw what's known as a payday shift for state employees. Um, that was something they enacted in 2003 uh, that meant that some state employees had to wait about two weeks for their uh, first paycheck in July, uh, the one that they had actually gotten on June 30th. And this year, Governor Polis wanted to reverse that payday shift um, and, and they've nibbled away at reversing it over the years but he wanted to kind of finish off that reversal because he said, if we get another recession, we're gonna wish we had that available. Well, guess what, you know. Um, you also had lawmakers who had a lot of experience because term limits really hadn't hit just yet. So you had people who'd been on the Joint Budget Committee for a decade or longer and, and had a lot of experience in dealing with um, the state finances, a lot more than what you see in today's Joint Budget Committee. Uh, Bob Rankin from Carbondale has seven years of experience. He's never been through a recession or he's never had to go through the kind of cutting that they're doing, but he's got the most experience of anybody. What you do have is you have JBC staff with decades of experience. And in fact, the director of the JBC staff has been there for 25 years. So she's actually been through those last two budget cuts, uh, those recessions. Um, same thing in 2000, the 2009, 2010 year, where you had the, and, and you still see the results of that one. And that the, the biggest result of that, of course, is the cuts to uh, K-12 education. They started off with 1.1 billion, a 1.1 billion thing that they called the negative factor. Now they call it the budget stabilization factor. Well, the proposal from the Joint Budget Committee to balance this particular budget is to pretty much go right back where they started from in 2010. Uh, what's what's interesting about what we've seen past, Mary, and you've seen this before? Do you remember the ugly list? The what? Remember the ugly list? Remember the ugly oh, list? Yes. Yeah. So at one time, it, uh, and I apologize, my I'm up in the mountains right now, so my connection is coming and going. But they had this ugly list, and they were just like all. Oh, scenarios of things that could happen, things that could get cut. Um, and, and Marianne, you mentioned higher education. The way things are with the Colorado budget and the way the, the Constitution is, there's very few things that the JBC has a lot of flexibility over, um, or any flexibility over, I should say. And higher ed is one of them, and that it has almost virtual flexibility over. They can not at all which is almost what they're, I think they're looking at right now. Um, they, you know, there are a few other things that they have some flexibility over, like the homestead exemption. They kind of dealt with that a little bit with the uh, table refund, not that we're gonna have that for a while. So the question is whether or not they're gonna fund the, the, uh, the, uh, the property tax exemption for, the, for seniors, um, stuff like that. But what gets me, and I've been through looking three now, um, major budget cuts like this. Maybe it's just, maybe this is the third. But what gets me is how everybody uh, corrals, everybody, every special interest. And by special, I mean, you know, special interest could be a wide special interest, okay? But everybody's forever. We've been doing this and that. And so you should not cut us kind of thing. Um, uh, we're seeing a lot of that now. When in 2008, 2009, I can't remember, Marianne, you, you probably do, when they cut the, uh, the K-12, I mean, that was previously under Amendment uh, 23, that was considered, you know, untouchable, uncuttable, and they found a way to do it. And so now they're, you know, they're in the arrears of that from the, uh, from the, uh, um, the, the budget stabilization factor or whatever name they want to give to it, we're going to see some even worse stuff than that. We're going to see 
lobbyists at each other's throats over this. We've always already kind of seen Bomber and CCI and CML already, you know, like a month ago, jumping on the legislature to, you know, make sure that that CARES money got to local governments. And so now the, but it was off this week. In a month, I won't get another week off in several weeks. But I would have to take this week off when the governor then decides what he's going to do with CARES money after, and, you, and, and Representative Tipton is right. He said almost a month ago, that's a in that month. Now he's decided some of which is going to higher ed. This is an R and D. This is a Republican versus Democrat. This is everybody for themselves trying. It looks like we lost Charles, and I think he was in the middle of something that uh, he had reported um, earlier. Oh, there he's back. But he had reported talking about the um, about uh, Tipton was upset because he had asked uh, Polis where he was going to disperse or di where he was going to distribute some of the uh, CARES Act money, and uh, um, Polis had at the time had said, you know, no, 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 no the legislature does that dispersal. And then of course, uh, he issued an executive order earlier this week where he did that. Marshall, um, you know, can you talk a little bit maybe about what you're hearing from viewers or some of that kind of comment, it, just in terms of like the special interests or that sort of thing? Well, I'll say like, we reported on that yesterday and Charles has, has gotten two things out of the governor that has gone gangbusters. And that was one of them with that question that got that answer one month ago. And we showed that answer in its raw form in yesterday, which was a 30 second, the legislature has the power of the purse, yada, yada, yada. It, I'll work with the legislature and the JBC. And then we yesterday showed what's supposed to happen with the budget that the governor has recommendations, but it's the legislature and the JBC that ultimately decide. And we got this uh, Twitter thread from somebody bashing us for being pro polis. And <laughs> Steve Steger, to his credit, tried to be like, are you kidding? Like, did you, are you, did you watch what we did yesterday? We, we played this sound that contradicted what he did and then explained what the process is supposed to be. And it was back and forth on Twitter until the guy finally admitted that he hadn't seen it, watched it, and apologized. So that's, from a viewer standpoint, that's what we deal with. We still deal with the echo chamber that you can do the story um, that one day will appease one side and piss off the other side, and then the next day it's reversed. And yet they still don't realize that you've covered both sides of the issue for them. And that's something that we have to fight with all the time, but I mean, I approach a story as if you have something you want me to investigate, kind of like what happened yesterday with what was, what did the governor do and why did he do it one month after saying the opposite? I'll do that story. And if you have something on the other side that you want me to look at because you got pissed off that I did that story, I'll do that too. Um, from a special interest, so this is where Marianne and Charles being at the Capitol more often and being in tune with lobbyists and 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 having the, the time spent there, they're more closely, into and knowledgeable about like the back channeling of stuff like that. I've noticed that um, I can talk off the record with a Republican who will tell me I'm okay with what Polis has done until a certain point most recently. Then it's like, okay, we're done with this now. I can talk to a Democrat off the record who's like, man, we're overreaching now, but neither side will say that on the record on camera. And that's what bothers me the most because now it's not just COVID-19 that's about politics, but it's everything that comes out of their mouth is about winning their seats. What is wrong with someone who's liberal saying we've overreached? And what's wrong with someone who's conservative saying I'm okay with shutting down like we have? I, I just wish we could get that on the record to not make this the muddied mess that it's going to be that Charles was alluding to with lobbyists at each other's throats because lawmakers are, are towing this line of what they can say publicly versus what they'll say privately. I, th I think it'll be interesting when we come back next week and they introduce the budget bill and the what they call the orbitals, all the bills that go go with it. And we're probably running somewhere between 30, between three and four dozen orbital bills at this point. 
um, it's, it, I, I don't know how much the lobbyists are going to have a chance to be at each other's throats because every penny that they go after right now means that you'd better find somewhere else to cut from. Uh, as of this morning, when the uh, Joint Budget Committee staff presented the budget, uh, the, the sort of the overview, and what they're cutting here is general fund. It's not, it's not federal dollars, it's not the cash, and well, it is to some degree, some, some cash uh, funds that they're transferring in. It's, it's a discretionary spending, uh, which is the general fund, and that's made up of sales and income taxes. And when you have to cut 25% of your spending, your discretionary spending, that there's, there's no room um, to fund people's pet projects. That said, there's still a couple of pet projects I've noticed still haven't uh, fallen to the budget acts. And I think the biggest one at this point of, of what's left is reinsurance. That was a bill that passed in 2019 to help lower the cost of health insurance premiums, um, primarily in rural Colorado. That's where the benefit has been the biggest. The second year of that program is $60 million. And I think that there is a draft reinsurance bill out there from the Joint Budget Committee. Um, I don't believe they've taken action on it yet. And I, one of the things that I've asked the governor repeatedly is what are you willing to cut to protect reinsurance and I, I, you know, I haven't gotten an answer to that. Um, they just keep saying, we, we have to fund this, we have to fund this because this helps lower health insurance costs and you can't, you can't raise health insurance when you're in the middle of a pandemic. Um, I, I still wonder if that one is going to make it to the finish line because $60 million right now, is, when, you, when you still have a billion dollars to cut, this morning they were told, you still have 1.17 to cut out of that $3 billion. That's how much they're short. And I think they'll probably, um, they've got $600 million that they're considering for the uh, budget stabilization factor, which takes it right back to where they started. In fact, it's, it's about $15 million above where they started 10 years ago. Um, but you still have a half billion to cover after that. So that's what they're debating tonight. Where's that other half billion gonna come from? assuming that they can get the um, legislative leadership and to agree to increase the budget stabilization factor. I don't, I don't know where they come up with that other half billion. I really don't. I asked the governor today in his press conference if he is thinking about things like loans and furloughs for state employees. And if you saw the Denver Post late this afternoon, CU Denver announced that they are asking everyone to take uh, furloughs. And it wasn't you know, one day a month. It's, it's like three, uh, I think it was 24 days for some employees. That's, that's over six months. That's, that's one day every week. So Charles, uh, you've joined us now by phone. Um, what do you, you know, what are your, what are you hearing from like the Western Slope in terms of that, you know, not only are they dealing with the, you know, everything that's happening regarding the budget, but there's also um, the oil and gas drop and some of those uh, you know, some of the other economical, you know, crises that we're going through. Maybe. Has anyone turned Charles off and on yet? I don't that's think he's my, actually my dialed IT in. Helmet. Yeah, I, don't, no. I don't think he's actually dialed in, Linda. I've I've uh, <laughs> I've, I've given him the stuff, and I, I think it's okay. just um. So let let's go to another okay. panelist. Okay. All right. So, Marshall, you know, I, well, I guess so let's ask let's ask you that question. I mean, in terms of that, you know, we're we're hearing a lot more about furloughs. We're hearing a lot more about some of those other kinds of things. Um, you know, what are what's the what's the next step? What's the thing that can that you know, what are the other places that they can be looking for money? Uh, it's my impression is that they're begging the feds for even more money that, yeah. that they've been doubled down on the sound bites of and, and the news releases and the letters to Congress that we want to implore Congress that we have an issue here. And I, I don't know. And this is where 
Um, and I, Marianne would, and Charles both would be better to answer this about, and I saw the question about how is Tabor affecting this. I don't know if Tabor is in the back of the mine, like if you cut so much that you've impacted where you can go the next year, or if I'm overthinking what Tabor does in relation to no, that. No, as far as Tabor, can you guys hear me? As far yeah, as Tabor goes, you. okay, I'm sorry. As far as Tabor goes, they kind of dealt with that in 2005 with the referendum C. They can go back. The, Tabor is not going to be an issue. Um, for one thing, there's not going to be a Tabor refund beyond this year. They've already dealt with that uh, with the lowering of the sales tax rate for this year. So, so that was my first thoughts was whether or not they're going to have to cut that money out as far as this budget package. But as I understand it, that's not the case. Uh, so going forward, so Tabor's not going to be an issue. Um, so have you, before I lose you again, you asked the question about what they're thinking about out here. One of the biggest things they're thinking about out here is not so much what, what the legislature is doing, but about what is going to happen in the economy going forward. Um, and so uh, there are several bill, bills that, uh, there are a couple of bills that people are interested in, in that it's designed to, you know, help offer tax credits um, so that businesses can continue to, to grow and, and be attracted here. One of which is called the Rural Start Program. It's around since 2015, it's actually been fairly successful for rural areas, uh, and it's set to expire in a year, not this year, but next year. Um, and so there's a bill in this year, to not only to expand or to extend it for another five years, but to expand it uh, uh, and to allow more uh, local uh, rural areas to be able to utilize it. And uh, so that was one of the third things that I dealt with with the governor over this uh, um, this whole thing was what was going to happen with that bill. The uh, the Office of Economic Development and International Trade initially told the leaders who are supporting the bill it's already gotten out of the house before they went on their COVID recess, um, and then and that liaison had told the senator, "Can you drop the bill because we just don't have time to, to carry it?" Um, and so that senator came to me and said, "You know, this is what they want to do. That bill doesn't cost any money." Mm -hmm. no offense to it, but that is to uh, pay half a year's salary to a person who already works in that office. The rest of it is uh, is money that the, the state is not getting now. This bill is designed to encourage businesses to come in, they give them tax credits, um, but they're, they're not money that goes back to, to, to businesses. It's new businesses that don't pay into it. So there's no loss to the state. So it's those kinds of bills, those even even bills like that that do, does cost the state some money that people are concerned about because they want to be able to recover from all this. They want to be able to come back uh, to the you know to some sort of some. Right, I think that's a really good point, Charles. That there is that case of where you know everybody says, well, just spend less. But I feel like we've been spending less for so many years that, you know, there were certainly a lot of wish lists and a lot of things that, you know, were put on the budget when we thought we had the surplus, but um, there was still a lot of things that a lot of people thought were already underfunded. And so um, it was just trying to get us back up to, you know, up to, up to zero. So anyway, but uh, <clears throat> I think that's a really good point. Um, so then, you know, let's move on just in terms of talking about like some of the uh, bills that have been left on the table. Um, you know, uh, we have seen them pull the public option. Uh, they've uh, decided to move family leave, uh, or I should say, let the initiatives go forward and that that would be the how they would address family uh, paid family leave. Um, vaccinations. Are there, are there other pieces of legislation that people are, that you're hearing people talk about that it's like, you know, either A, it has no chance or B, they've got to find some way to deal with that? Well, bottom line, any bill that has any kind of fiscal note is gone. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, capital construction, for example, what they're talking about right now is instead of the 190 million they were going to spend, now they're going to spend maybe $2 million on just controlled maintenance. So that's going to be gone. So any university uh, that's trying to get money for their capital construction, forget about it. It's not going to happen. 
what ha what's happened in the last 24 hours is that um, some of the big institutions, CU and CSU, have had some big projects where they were expecting a whole lot of general fund support for this year. Um, and they went to the JBC and said, we'll, we'll cash fund the next phase of this project, which makes the JBC a little bit nervous because if they cash fund um, the, the cost for this upcoming fiscal year, it sort of implies that they're gonna come back in a year and expect the money will be there. And I don't think you can make that expectation. But the committee yeah. did approve uh, cash funding for one project up at up Boulder, I believe. Or no, I'm sorry, it's a, a project at the Anschutz campus. And then another project up at CSU and said, if you've got the cash funds to put, to keep these projects going, go forward and, and continue those. But you know, if there's an expectation that next year there might be money for them, I, I don't think that's going to happen. Right. It, because it's on you, it's on you, uh, university or college, that if we can't, you know, follow this up in a year, then you're going to have to come up with more money or you're going to have to just scrap it in a year. Yep. So that's, that's, a, that's a risk. That's a risk for them to take. Yes, it is. Very much so. And, and Charles is right, anything, anything with a, a, a fiscal note, um, a cost to the state, the money's not there, period. Um, one of the p big things that I've been following for the last probably five years or so is a little thing called conservation easements. And that had a, and, and while it didn't have a, a fiscal note, they were planning to use tax credits uh, that are available for that program. Well, the tax credits are gone. So, so, and, and that was going to make whole um, people who had lost uh, tax credits from this this uh, state program, and the way that that was run by the Department of Revenue back up through about 2014. Um, that that had a 145 million dollar fiscal note. Eh, not going to happen. And every year, every year they talk about reviewing tax credits. And there are like millions of dollars that go out in tax credits. This is a year, if they're going to look at that, this is a year they're going to have to really look at and scrutinize what tax credits are worth keeping around because they can't afford to keep these around. And not this year, maybe not even next year. Yeah. So we got a, a question from Allison Trembley who's watching and she asked about a full day kindergarten and uh, what is happening with that. Full day kindergarten, uh, this, this was interesting. And, 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 a, and a question that I asked the governor repeatedly was, uh, along with reinsurance, what are you willing to do to protect full day kindergarten? Um, it's, it's protected, sort of. Um, what, what happened is after that bill passed, um, it became a, a standard part of the uh, K-12 education budget. So it's no longer a standalone kind of thing um, going into this next fiscal year. So what, what the decision is, is that um, it's a $220 million additional cost this year. And when the Joint Budget Committee got done uh, earlier this week, looking at all their, their uh, different programs, um, they said K-12 would need a $277 million increase to cover its expenses for 2020-21. And, and 220 million of that is full day kindergarten. So what they're gonna do instead is just hike up the budget stabilization factor and then let the districts, local districts decide, can they afford to offer full day kindergarten? It's gonna be up to the local districts to decide. And the, the other thing that we've not been talking about here is that that's, that's not happening inside the legislature but it's happening outside of it. It's what Gallagher is doing to local property taxes. And that's going to lead these school districts to back away from uh, from uh, kindergarten spending because they're going to lose the money locally. That's not going to get backfilled from the state. So because that's a buy-in program by the local districts, I think we're going to see a lot more of those local districts go to, ha to, to a half-day kindergarten or, or, or not at all because they're just not going to be able to afford it because they're not going to be able to get the local money to do it. And the Joint Budget Committee staff, when they talked about um, their recommendation, or it's not even a recommendation, an option to increase the budget stabilization factor, they said, if the local districts um, look at this, they, they will make one of two decisions. They'll either eliminate full day kindergarten 
or go back to that point half that sort of half of a day is what they were paying for before and ask and ask parents to cover the rest well parents won't be able to cover the rest because um, they're all struggling financially just like everybody else so you may see a whole lot of school districts dropping full-day kindergarten yeah well let me ask this question as a last in first out mentality and I had asked this to the JBC I know Governor Polis is not a mandator but just this idea that you could save money as a state by having districts opt not to offer full day kindergarten that doesn't help your budget problem because nope. you're you're leaving it on the school districts to decide not to spend the money which means you've cut to get to zero just to find out that you might have a hundred million that wasn't spent because school districts decided not to offer it. It just seems like a bad cop out strategy uh, from, and so this is where I have, this is where I wonder like, I've asked the question, Mary Ann's asked the question, and it seems to be like a protected thing. Like if you're being really honest about $3 billion, I mean, 200 and some odd million is a good chunk. And it's one of the last things that was added I feel like good, like goodwill to the people would say, this is a pet project of mine and we got to back out of it before, because we have no choice. We have to back out of it. We have to run a bill that says, let's change kindergarten back to 0.58. Yeah. I don't, I don't, they don't, have, to, don't, they don't have to do anything legislative. That's a little ways. I think we will. Charles, Did I think you don't have to do something legislatively. They they have never even considered it's up to the local school because it's going to be a hundred. It's it's up to the one hundred and seventy eight school districts. It it really is. Um, they, right. the ABC has never even considered running a bill to back it out. No, but they don't have to. Yeah, they don't have to. It's it's already in the law. That's right. right. Um, uh, Representative Jim Wilson put it to me, and I reported this last week. Um, if you. It, you can't pick on one grade and decide you're not going to fund that one grade, whether it's kindergarten or fifth grade or seventh grade. I mean, that, that is how they now view this. It, it's, it's a grade just like any other grade. Mm. You cut the senior, <clears throat> you cut the, the uh, sixth grade, whatever. Yeah, we've got a, and there are some other questions. And, you know, if, um, I was thinking that what I would do is I would ask you this one last question, which actually Marshall had kind of, uh, alluded to, which was in relation to um, just the demeanor that we're kind of seeing in the, you know, in the political discourse. And I'd like you guys for like maybe to talk about that for maybe five minutes or so, and then we'll go and we'll hit some of these questions that we're getting from various viewers. So, um, Marshall, why, Marshall, why don't you start? Oh, damn just it. I wanted to... <laughs> Before Charles loses his connection, I can let him go. <laughs> Yeah, let me go. Let me go. Let me go. Okay, please. Go, Look, go, go. This is the thing about the legislature. Politics never leaves that building. Okay, never, <laughs> ever, ever. And this is a political year. This is a very big political year. And so you've already seen it when, uh, when you know, this week. I hope we lost Charles. I'll take over where he left off. I asked this question, sorry Charles. I asked this question at the Republican. Oh, and go. go ahead, Marshall. I uh, asked this question at the Republican news conference about their four point plan to reopen the other day. And there's like, I don't have a eloquent way of asking the question. Basically I said, do you believe everything that you're spouting that we need to reopen? Like, or are you just taking the contrarian position because that's what you're elected to do and that's what, you're, what you need to do to win an election again? And I use, I, I, I mean, Patrick Neville knows he's an example of this. Like, does he really go to this Castle Rock Cafe and buy his appliances from appliance factory and like happen to go to every shop that the state shut down? Or is he putting his face in front of this because he has future aspirations? I don't, like, that's a question that, there's no easy way to ask it and there's no way you're gonna get a fully honest answer, I don't think. And that's something that I wish we could cut through is, this goes back to what I said at the beginning, is can we have people who are Democrats that say we've gone too far and we have conservatives that are like, no, we've done, done just fine. And I wish there was a way that, I know there are certain lawmakers I will go to for some truth serum, 
off the record. And then when it comes time to saying, well, will you say that on camera? Maybe it's easier as a print person, but when I say, can you say that on camera? Then it becomes, well, maybe if someone else will say it too, I don't want to be alone. And you know, I'm in a tough dish. Like, it's like, no, just like, let's cut through that BS. Like that's the story. Those are the stories I, I want to do. And I envy Marianne and Charles and Jesse Paul and John Frank and, every, and everybody at the Post who, and Alex Rennes, like they do the in the weeds stories that need to be told with all the detail of what's happening in real time. But I also want to just do the story that cuts through the BS and, and gets someone to say something they're not supposed to say, even though they mean it. And this is the time to do that. But as Charles said, it's an election year. So you're not going to get that from people necessarily. That's my soapbox. Marianne, do you have anything to add to that? Um, it's it, We're in an interesting situation already because the Democrats already run things and they have done so to the exclusion of the Republicans. And we've seen that we've seen complaints about this where they may the, the Democratic leadership has made unilateral decisions about when they're coming back. May 20, that May 26 date, um, we got complaints that that uh, legislative that Republicans found out about it from reading it in the papers or seeing it on social media. Uh, the the agenda um, Republicans have complained that they have been left out uh, in discussions about what's going to happen next week. So, will that I, you know the, the thing that I'm kind of curious about is whether that's going to cause the Republicans to do some of the things they did last year, which was to have every bill read at length and to and and to play political tricks, if you will, um, because they're not being listened to. And I think I think that's a real risk. That's been one of my complaints is seeing these news releases come from partisan sides like the, the Democrats leadership are, are having this news conference. Well, it's like, well, well, how come you're not doing that jointly, especially to what Mary Ann just said about the extension of when they're gonna come back. It, it, it becomes politics for no reason. And then I have to spend my day doing a 45 second story or longer on just that, which is like trying to de like figure out what really happened versus just being able to say with a period, hey, the legislature figured out they have to do X, Y, and Z, and that's why they're not meeting until Tuesday the 26th when it's more, it's more um, nuanced than that, and it shouldn't be. You're muted, Linda. Sorry, we have a uh, uh, Pat Ratliff, um, who is a uh, lobbyist, um, and he has a question for you all. She. She. Hi, Charles. Hi. Sorry, my bad. Hi, Pat. Right. Hey, Pat. How are you? I'm good, honey. You, be quiet for a minute because I have to be really brief and then I'll catch you up later. Um, I've been a lobbyist for almost 40 years and have been through a lot of the things you've talked about. I don't want to spend any time on it, but the trial in the House on Steve Lebsock and throwing him out of the legislature during the Me Too movement was at least as bizarre as what we're doing today. You'll remember, Charles, Marianne, that people were wearing bulletproof vests to the house. Now, what I wanted to say to you is the one thing no one seems to have picked up yet. There are cities, and I know Greeley is one, Aurora is another, Denver's almost certainly another, and I cannot even begin to say how many counties whom I represented for 25 years who are going to be and already have laid off hundreds of staff because they live on sales tax. And when it's time for property tax payments, they're not going to get that either. And what that means is you won't have matching dollars for Medicaid and other human services programs. So even if the state comes up with their 3.3 billion without decimating Medicaid, the share that has to come from local governments is very likely to be missing. And I think that's an enormous budget consideration that I've seen no one talking about. 
And I'll stop there. Actually, Thank Pat, you, Pat. Uh, uh, Linda, if I may, Pat. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Well, well, Pat, you're right. I didn't think we can top the Me Too year. That was an amazing year. Oh, my <laughs> God. I didn't think we can top 2013 when they did all the gun bills. This is far beyond that. And you're right. I mean, like I said, every year is always a phenomenal year. But I disagree that we haven't been talking about the money to local governments. I did bring that up. I brought it up with the governor a couple of times when Tipton sent his first letter to the governor and CCI sent their letter to the governor saying, you know, you're going to use all that $1.7 million CARES money for the state budget and not give it to local. And he kept saying, no, it's up to the ledge to spend that money. And then just this week, we saw how he divvied up that money. That's a problem. It's good. Now, I know, I know that Kevin Baumner and, uh, um, and uh, John Swartout uh, have both said, thank you for that money for local governments. They did, you know, he did give that money to them, but that's going to be an issue too. But yeah, no, you're right. That is a big issue to local governments. That's what's sort of being lost in this because the state is talking about $3.3 billion. That's just state money. We're not even talking about local governments. The personal property tax issue that I talked about earlier, yes, that's going to be huge. We haven't really seen the impact of that. We knew that was coming. That had nothing to do with COVID. It's gotten worse partly because of it, but, it, but that was coming. That's the whole Gallagher issue. And so, yes, you're absolutely right. So you're going to start seeing local governments. We haven't seen that here yet in Grand Junction, but we will. I'm sure we will. And I'm sure you're going to see it in other, uh, other governments, other small governments, because that first CARES bill did not include any money for smaller governments of, uh, of, uh, of 500,000 population or less. And so they're, that's why they're still saying, Congress, you know, dump all that other stuff in that in that fifth COVID package and just focus on state and local governments to help them because it's the economy, stupid, that's going to carry us through. It's not going to be, it's not going to be the postal service. It's not going to be all this other stuff and it's going to come down to the local government. So Pat, you're absolutely right about all that. And I, and I want to throw, Oh, hello puppy. <laughs> <laughs> hello puppy. Mm -hmm. um, the one place that the JBC has, avoided uh, to uh, to cut and even when they decided they had to cut k-12 and increase the, the budget stabilization factor is in social services and i'm kind of waiting to see if that is the last place that they can go to cut it's going to have to be marianne it's going to have to be there's no other place for them to go yeah right. you're absolutely correct Right. Yeah. And one other thing I want to mention about the, the cut to uh, local government money, severance taxes. Pat had brought this up too about oil and gas oh, development. Yeah. We're, we're expecting that to go down to $16 million. I don't think it's ever been that low. That's hmm. statewide. That's yeah. nothing. That is nothing. One entity gets that in one year in a good oil and gas year. And this is not even about natural gas. This is about the oil stuff. And even that's not even about COVID either. But that's going to be another big hit because local governments get that hit. And so, by the way, is going to be DNR, Department of Natural Resources, Parks and Rec. We're going to see some problems out there. They're creating whole new state parks right now with a bill that already got through. There's no money for that. We're going to have to cut that, too. So there's going to be a lot of ugly stuff coming on that this is going to last more than just this year. In the in the yeah. previous recessions, I think one of the one of the things I thought was interesting was that severance taxes was the piggy bank or one of the piggy banks that, that they rated, and they rated over and over and over again every time. Three hundred million dollars worth. Three hundred million yeah. dollars worth. They still haven't paid, it back. Never I'm sorry, paid it back. And now that money is, you know, if they'd paid it back, they might have had something to tap. But but uh, there's no severance tax money for them. To, and, and that funds a lot of water projects too, which means you're going to see right. a lot of water projects that aren't going to get that, that right. get nothing. Right. Right. There won't be any. We may be going into another drought too. We had a good yep. good winter, but we've had no rain since then. We could be going into another drought. That's going to be a big problem. Going we're, we're already there. Three quarters of the state is in some form of drought uh, right. now, and we, we just we never we didn't we didn't get the snowpack this year that we needed, even despite the fact that the ski resorts were closed for two months. Yeah. All right, changing, changing, uh, shifting gears just a little bit. Um, uh, Curtis Hubbard actually had asked this question and Jeff Roberts, uh, my former colleagues. Um, 
they uh, <clears throat> both were talking about just uh, how people how people are going to feel going into the Capitol building. Um, in the case of Curtis, he's asking, you know, if COVID can be spread by asymptomatic and the guidance is that it spreads easier from person to person. Um, so how, how are you hearing from lawmakers at all about how they feel in terms of, uh, you know, where masks aren't required of everyone at the Capitol? You know, how are they handling that? Or what are they, what are they talking about? Well, can I? Can I answer that real quick and share my screen? Because I happened to, I had to go to the Capitol today to figure out where a camera could live on the house floor. And I saw some stuff that I'm not supposed to share yet because I don't have permission, but we're just among our, uh, our friends here. So if you don't mind. I have a club. Will... <laughs> I'm recording all of this, Marshall. <laughs> so is my screen shared right now? Yes. Is it uh, shares? Yes. Yeah, I can see it. Okay, so this is this is one of the uh, house basement committee rooms, and that's basically what that's going to look like for in-person um, testimony and committee hearings. Is that's how many people really can be inside, um, and then so they're really encouraging this remote testimony. That depending on where you fall, I mean, I, I'll go back to the bomb cyclone when it seemed very disingenuous that the Senate was still in session and saying, "Hey, if you want to send us your email statement, don't drive here; just send it to us." I've always wondered how much does a written testimony have weight in a decision? Granted, if you still believe decisions are made during the committee and not before the committee, then I have a lot of land for you to buy somewhere. But um, so this is what a committee room looks like. Uh, and I'll fast forward through what the house floor looks like. Um, so they've got plexi, they're still working on this. They're gonna be more stabilized, but this is the plexiglass in between uh, the, the seats of the house chambers. They had a Zoom practice going on on one of the screens um, earlier today for a few of the lawmakers that don't want to show up in person. And then I've heard a uh, little more than half a dozen have requested to be in the balcony, which means they will do testimony or um, they'll, they'll give their speeches from where my mouse is waving, like right around here. There'll be a microphone that I've been told is gonna be set up m mainly toward the middle. Um, so that's what that is gonna look like. What does that mean for will, will people be comfortable there? I, they've taken the recommendations here from lawmakers of what they'll be comfortable with, I guess. Um, and you'll have the few that don't want to be around, stay at home and participate via Zoom or remote capability. You'll have some in the, in the gallery and then you'll have the some on the floor. And if they're wearing masks, I don't know if it's going to be, man I can't remember if they landed on if it's mandatory or however you feel. Um, I, I'll tell you from my perspective. The guidance is uh, not mandatory. Okay. From my perspective, and my, my work has certain rules, and so I'm wearing my mask everywhere, and yet, and when I was at this thing outside with um, the Republicans the other day, some were getting very close and without masks. A lot of them were wearing masks. But I'll tell you, my comfort level changed. They, like, I kind of feel like you have to abide by the lowest common denominator, and if someone is a hypochondriac and a germaphobe, I have to abide by their rules. That's just where I'm at. I, so... I don't know if you're, gonna be, you're not going to feel comfortable if that's your mindset. Yeah. And I recall, like, you know, just listening, because I, I would listen to a lot of the testimony, you know, for the vaccination bills, for example, from my office. And so, I mean, there was a, a great deal of remote testimony, although a lot of people, you can tell, felt that it was better to I be there. I can tell you from, from, from history. You broke up, Charles. I think I know where he was going. Remote testimony is something that they have allowed for a couple of years now from various sites. Can you hear me now? Hello? Go ahead, Charles. Um, All right, yeah. So I can also tell you that lawmakers are going to be worried about themselves. The press and the lobbyists are not really smart people. We don't care as much. Yes, we'll wear the masks, but, but you know, they want to be there and we need to be there. And so, you know, those precautions are for the lawmakers, for the lawmakers, not so much for us. All right. But we don't need to be, I mean, I understand we need to be there to be the watchdog, but there is the Colorado channel that gets us 
enough access to get by, but it doesn't get us the access we want. So I, I'm just going to say from a comfort standpoint, at least thank goodness we have that option um, to fall back on. Right. And, and, we do, and, they, and they promise that they're going to be doing uh, regular briefings to the press, you know, Zoom briefings for those who don't want to be there, and we hope they will. We will press them to continue to do that because some of us may, in the press may not even want to be there, be able to be there. I'm not even sure how much I'm going to be there. I'm going to try to be there, but, you know, I'm, I'm a five threat um, to this COVID. You know, I'm old, I smoke, I have diabetes. That's just three of them. So I don't know, you know what I'm saying? But, but, it's, but I can also tell you that it's times like these that you have to watch these lawmakers very, very closely because that's when they will do the most sneaky things that you don't want to ever see in government. Despite, and I, I would say that this is a very transparent government, a very transparent legislature, but I've seen things that they have done that you still need to, we still need to watch very, very closely. Yeah, that was actually a question from uh, Quentin Young, who had uh, tweeted me and asked the question about that, aside from the work that journalists will be doing to report, you know, are you seeing, you know, comprom you know, where public access or transparency has been compromised compared Absolutely. to what you were doing? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Uh, um, you know, there's a, there's a certain lack of transparency that kind of goes on all the time in the General Assembly. Uh, lawmakers will go off and have little side conversations and they'll do it on the floor of the house very openly. Uh, and, and, the, and this goes on all the time. This, this has grown exponentially in this crisis. Uh, for example, these, these guidelines that they released on how they were gonna conduct business, they formed an ad hoc committee. Did we know about it? Did we know that they were having meetings? No. Um, they, they've, they've made all kinds of decisions behind closed doors. And one of the things that I've been uh, starting to ask about, and, and I've talked a little bit to Jeff Roberts about this, is when you look at the record of how a government operates, what, what kind of records are we gonna have for how the government operated during this pandemic? How did the General Assembly acted? How the governor's office acted with all of his various different teams? We have no records of any of this. And this just drives me up the wall. I'll tell, uh, this is one of the things that, it, that I find more irritating as a journalist than anything is a lack of transparency in government operations. And this has been, uh, this is, this has been a, a pandemic of its own. Absolutely. So um, I, uh, we're just about to the seven o'clock time. This has been a fascinating discussion and I appreciate so much. Um, I don't know if anybody has any final words or things that we need to make sure that we're still doing. All right, so, so Linda, you had asked in your email uh, for us to impart some sort of odd story that we've heard or seen. Yeah. You wanna do that now? Yeah, that would be great. Okay, so this is not really related to the legislature or politics, but it does have to do with the mentality of people. So about a month ago, before the stay-at-home order was put in place, before the mass law was put in place, I was leaving home here and I stopped at a liquor store. Uh, and next to me in line was a guy wearing a hoodie, a mask, the hood was over. He was wearing those really weird looking yellow kitchen gloves and he's fumbling with his money to pay his bill and I just looked over to him and said you know in a normal time if you come into a liquor store dressed like that the cops will be on you in a second <laughs> right yes it was funny the guy did not think it was funny he turned to me and berated me like you would not believe um. and all I could say was if we lose our sense of humor in all this we may as well not be saved as a species that's great. Hey, Marshall. I don't have, I don't have a politics-based odd story. Um, mine is just about working from home. Uh, Kyle and Steve had a short challenge because when I set up downstairs, I had a couple of Emmys in the background, and so <laughs> Kyle thought it would be funny. Like, could you sneak an Emmy in every show? And I thought that was very cocky, and I didn't know. 
And of course I did. <laughs> and um, one of the one of my favorite stories, because I like to demonstrate, and it's hard to demonstrate in this environment. And uh, I did a golf story about what why is a golf course okay to be open, and we went to Adams County about their golf courses. And so I set up a mini golf course in my home for my live shot. And I'm like, <laughs> you could just grab some household things, and I set up like Emmys to be like the things that you shoot through. And <laughs> that was my very awful way of getting. Uh, quote, a number of Emmys into the live shop, which you wouldn't be able to do any other time. <laughs> Marianne, you have a funny story? Um, my, my favorite is actually something that I've um, been trying to persuade my HO, the, the guy who runs our HOA. Uh, I, I have these signs um, and uh, they're for my heart business, but I have covered them with something else. And I'm going to sneak this out one of these days here. Um, at the end of my, my property, um, to put up one of these signs that says, you are now entering the Ministry of Silly Walks. Commence your silly walk. Uh, <laughs> if you're a Monty Python fan, you, you know this one. Um, and I, I want to see how people react to it as they're walking down the street. I want to say I've seen something like that on YouTube, and I think that if people, of course, obliged because you know what else you got to do. Well, yeah. What what else? What else would you do? Can I respond to Quentin Young's question about the Colorado Fiscal Institute tax? Sure. I, I really want to make sure that gets addressed. Um, I, I I have been talking to a couple of different folks about this, and the chances of that getting through the House possible, maybe. You, could, you, need, you need to get three Republicans to sign up for it in order to get, uh, to get it through the House. In the Senate, you need five Republican senators who would go for this. I, I don't think on, on any, any day there would be five Republicans who would go for this. It's, it's a lovely idea, but I, and, and we certainly need some source of revenue, this emergency tax provision, but I don't, I don't see five senators going for it. Yeah, and for all the reasons that Marshall brought up earlier, just in terms of that, you know, they've got an election to think yep. about, and that's yep. not going to happen. I, I just, I don't see it happening. All right. Okay. Well, I think that ends up our hour. Um, you know, I previously was on the board of the Denver Press Club, but then when I, um, when I took over at Colorado Politics, I decided I needed to focus my attention there, but I absolutely love the press club for being able to encourage these conversations. And I hope you've enjoyed this time. And thank you so much for uh, tuning in and for your great questions. So, and thank you to my panelists and give a clap. And, um, and of course, because it's a press club, I'm drinking while I talk. So anyway, all right. Well, you guys have a great night and thanks again. Thanks everybody. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for setting this up, Linda. Thanks, Linda. Thank you. <laughs>